We're going to be speaking today on the topic, the implication of COVID-19 on expatriate employment in Nigeria. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join uh, this discussion uh, and hope that you will find it very useful and uh, the information you'll get from the discussions will be very uh, relevant to your um, work and everything that we're doing in the current circumstances that we found ourselves in. Uh, we have today two panelists, very seasoned and experienced um, lawyers in the two very interesting uh, areas of practice that we're discussing today. I have with me um, Mr. Bimbo Atilola, Atitola, my apologies, who is- uh, Atilola. Atilola. Thank you, sir. I was right the first time. Thank you very much, sir. Um, who is a labor and employment law consultant and the managing partner of Hybrid Solicitor. He's also the editor-in-chief of Labor Law Review, a quarterly journal on labor and employment law. He has authored and edited a number of leading and frequently cited public, published works in labor and employment law and is a member of several uh, professional organizations, including the Nigerian and International Bar Associations, uh, the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management in Nigeria, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators UK, and the Chartered Institute of Taxation in of Nigeria. Thank you very much, Mr. Tilola, for joining us and for um, accepting our invitation today. Also on the panel is uh, Chinedu Ozo. Chinedu is the head of the Immigration and Business Advisory Unit here at BCSL. Uh, he's a seasoned lawyer with over 15 years of school experience and is also a member of several professional uh, bodies, including the Enterprise Risk Management Professionals, the International and Nigerian Bar Association, and the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Chinedu, for joining us today. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm not sure I mentioned earlier, my name is Anne Agbo, and I welcome you all to today's session. My apologies for that omission. Uh, very quickly now, without wasting time, I'd like to just speak briefly on the background and the reason why we at DCSL thought it very important to uh, discuss, have a discussion on this topic of uh, the impact of the pan pandemic on the expatriate, on expatriate employment in Nigeria. So we all know that uh, prior to the uh, the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, Nigeria had, and I think I, I would like to believe, uh, still has a very large expatriate community, which continues to, you know, uh, make our country more competitive and uh, contribute to the, uh, to the GDP. However, in the wake of the pandemic and the lockdown, most organizations that have expatriate employees have had to grapple with how on managing not just the welfare of the employees, but also uh, with uh, the regulatory requirements that are associated with expatriate employment. Uh, so to this topic uh, and our discussion is not only very important, but very germane because it has become critical for employees to be aware of the implications of the pandemic and their expatriate employees uh, and how to appropriately respond to these issues uh, given current realities. Uh, so we hope that we will be able to address all the critical uh, issues that this topic raises during the course of the discussion. Now, um, I, we understand that uh, quite a number of us, we have questions to ask during the course of the discussion. Uh, we propose, however, that we um, put those questions down in the Q&A section of the webinar, and then uh, we'll take those questions at the end of the discussion by the panelists. Without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, speak to the very first issue that we have on the table today. And that question goes to Mr. Ozo. Are you able to kindly provide some insight on the process for expatriate employment in Nigeria? Okay, thank you, Anne, our able moderator, and um, welcome uh, 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 all our participants to uh, this uh, webinar series. Um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the, uh, the immigration of expatriates, uh, employment of expatriates in Nigeria is regulated by the uh, Nigerian Immigration Act 2015 and the immigration regulations uh, that was issued in 2017, portion to the act. 
So the act uh, basically controls the immigration of expatriates into Nigeria and provides for the grant of relevant entry permits as uh, stipulated during. Um, the administration of the Immigration Act falls within the purview of the Federal Ministry of Interior uh, with the support of the uh, various uh, agencies like the NIPC, the NDLEA, the Corporate Affairs Commission. However, the Nigerian Immigration Service, which is an agency under the Federal Ministry of Interior, is the main government agency that is charged with the responsibility of regulating and approving the immigration and immigration of expatriates to and from Nigeria, and the grants of relevant visas and entry permits. So um, expatriate employment usually starts with the identification of a skill gap in an organization and confirmation that the skills required cannot be reasonably found in Nigeria. Once this is ascertained, an application would usually be lodged uh, for a grant of expatriate quota uh, with the Federal Ministry of Interior. Um, the applicant will be required to show proof that it is a registered uh, business uh, organization in Nigeria. It has an identified place of business. It has, uh, it has registered with the relevant tax authorities and that it has remitted part of the capital required to run its business by producing a certificate of capital imposition with a face value of not less than 10 million naira and other um, uh, uh, required documents. In certain cases, the applicant might be required to show proof of consent issued by other uh, government uh, agencies like the National uh, Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board for companies operating in the oil and gas sector. So generally, once the uh, relevant documentary requirements are submitted, uh, the, applica the application would be reviewed at the Federal Ministry of Interior, and if it is found to have met the extant regulatory requirements, an expert quota certificate will be issued. So once the expert quota um, is issued, which normally is for a three years period, uh, the company will now is then allowed to uh, uh, go into a proper employment uh, procedure whereby it negotiates uh, the employment terms with the expatriate that they identified. And then, you know, the expatriate, once uh, he or she is issued with a, a, an employment letter, he proceeds to the Nigerian embassy in his home or uh, country of residence for the issuance of. Um, uh, SCR visa. You know, once the SCR visa is issued, the expatriate is expected to come into Nigeria and regularize him within three months. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, basically the procedure uh, for expatriate uh, employment in Nigeria. Thank you very much, Nidhi. Uh, so leading on from your response, uh, you have highlighted something that leads me to the next question, which is uh, to uh, Mr. Tilola. On the issue of the, of the essentialness of the skill or the rareness of the skill that the expatriate uh, is required to provide. Uh, Mr. Atilola, my question to you would be, are the contributions of expatriate to the development of the economy, uh, what would you say are the contributions of this, of the expatriate, and particularly to the development of the pool of essential and rare technical skills? Uh, and capabilities, what would you say is the extent to which this has impacted or can impact on the nation? Uh, thank you, uh, our very able moderator. The, what is clear now is that uh, the entire world uh, uh, has become a, a one very big global village and, and globalization is, uh, I mean, the waves is everywhere. So no country is an island uh, uh, to its own. So there must be movement of persons from one country to the other. And as we all know, one of the reasons why we even bring in expatriates is to bridge knowledge gaps. So meaning that uh, the expatriate coming into our various sectors where there is perceived uh, knowledge gaps, especially like in the oil and gas industry, manufacturing, mining, etc. Uh, so they are coming in as significant uh, impact to uh, productive uh, development of the economy. Uh, and, and of course, when they come in, they are here to contribute to uh, productive uh, uh, ventures in Nigeria, and which leads to production of goods and services, which we can also export and hand uh, foreign exchange. And like you have rightly noted, 
the expatriate community in Nigeria is fast increasing. Uh, in fact, in the last few years, the influx of expatriates in Nigeria has been very phenomenal. And this has tax implications because expatriates are taxable in Nigeria. And when they pay their taxes to the, re to the uh, relevant tax authorities, so uh, we gain as a country uh, because that's a major source of uh, revenue. Uh, it's, it's also important to, to note that a good number or percentage of expatriates that come in into Nigeria are employed by multinationals and foreign companies. And when multinationals come to the country to come and do business and they bring in also uh, their expatriates, it's, this is also connected with foreign capital uh, movement because if you are going to be doing businesses in Nigeria and you are bringing your expatriates, you also need to bring your capital. So we, we have direct foreign uh, investments, uh, which is very critical to a country like us. Uh, I mean, it, it's, this has significant impact on, on our economy. Then we should also not forget the importance of knowledge transfer. Uh, as we know, one of the uh, local content requirements in Nigeria is that where expatriates are engaged in a particular function, uh, it is, it, they are required to also train the indigenous manpower, the, the, uh, the, their subordinates, their indigenous subordinates, so that after some time, they can uh, uh, competently take uh, over from them. So there is, uh, uh, by reason of expatriate employment and expatriate influx, so there is contribution to the development of indigenous manpower across various sectors in Nigeria. So like I said, I mean, globalization has made this happen. Uh, it will continue to increase. And uh, with the relative, uh, 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 I mean, the, the relative flexibility in the foreign investment laws in Nigeria, including uh, 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 the law relating to movement of expatriates from one country to, to Nigeria, it is expected that post COVID-19, uh, that the outlook uh, will be very good and Nigeria will have a lot to benefit from this as a country. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so that leads me to the next question, uh, which is uh, to Chinedu. And my question is, what would you consider to be the impact of the current pandemic on expatriate employment in Nigeria generally? You've muted yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. So thank okay. you very much. And uh, once more, um, as we all know, it is very clear that Nigeria is currently facing an unprecedented health and perhaps economic challenge. Unprecedented in the sense that never in the history of this country have we uh, ever witnessed such number of infections, deaths, and um, lockdown attributable to a single ailment or disease. So as many have put it, uh, and quite recently too, uh, we are fighting a war with an unseen uh, enemy. And this war has also impacted on various aspects of our nationhood, and will perhaps leave some scars and wounds that would probably take a long time uh, to heal. So one area that uh, the scars of the pandemic will be felt for a long time is employment in, uh, in general in Nigeria particularly the employment of expatriates. So the current uh, health challenge in Nigeria is um, impacting expatriate um, uh, employment in perhaps uh, three ways, which I will call, uh, number one is the pre-employment uh, procedure. Uh, as we all know, expatriate employment begins uh, with the uh, application for an issuance of requisite expatriate quota and um, which conveys uh, the uh, minister's approval for a company to, to hire um, expatriates and uh, designates the position to which those expatriates will be employed. And then, as we all, all know, the current pandemic has forced the shutdown of key uh, government ministries, agencies, and parasitals. One of such key agencies is the Federal Ministry of Interior, which has been shut down since the first week of March. Uh, well, the gradual shutdown of the ministry first started in the first week of March with the reduction in the activities of the ministry. 
and then the full uh, full shutdown started uh, with the bro first broadcast uh, by the president. So with the shutdown, companies and organizations willing to or wishing to uh, process expatriate quota are currently unable to do so, and thus unable to assess the requisite manpower they need for their businesses. For me, this situation is worrisome, considering that application for expatriate quota is usually done or, and processed online. So one would have expected that uh, the shutdown uh, would, have, would have had just minimal impact on the activities of the ministry uh, charged with this responsibility. However, this is not the case, as even, even if one decides to initiate an application online, uh, the application will likely be stuck uh, as relevant approving officers, particularly the data and automation center at the ministry, uh, not available to vet and um, approve the application. So another big, uh, another leg to this also is uh, has to do with the fact that several companies who have expatriate quota certificates are currently unable to bring their, bring in their expatriates due to the inability to assess relevant Nigerian embassies abroad to issue SCR visas or even where such visas have been uh, issued, the inability to gain entry into the country due to the current. Uh, lockdown. And then I'll go to uh, the impacts on ongoing compliance obligations. You know, it is also clear that the uh, lockdown is currently affecting the ability of companies to fulfill uh, their compliance obligations under the Immigration Act and the Immigration Regulations. Uh, some of these obligations relate to renewal and extension of visas, filing of appropriate quota returns to the Nigerian Immigration Service and the Federal Ministry of Interior, Response, uh, responding to uh, investigation activities by the NIS, renewal of expatriate quota, conclusion of regularization of stay, and um, generally all the um, immigration compliance requirements. They are currently unable to do this uh, as a result of this lockdown, and that will impact um, on their uh, operations. And then it might also interest us to know that uh, most expatriates are technically out of employment and illegally residing in Nigeria as a result of expired expatriate quota certificates, which they are currently unable to renew. This is because, as we all know, uh, the legality of an expatriate employment in Nigeria is tied to the validity of the underlying expatriate quota certificate. And indeed, it is assumed that once uh, 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 the quota expires, uh, which is the underlying uh, uh, power to employ, you know, that the expatriate will be deemed to be technically you know, out of employment and it still will be invalid. It, to, to this end, that uh, the Immigration Act provided some uh, penalties, you know, for expatriates who failed to renew their uh, requisite uh, permits. Furthermore, the travel ban on air travel has also made it possible, as we noted earlier, for expatriates to have who have been validly empo employed by Nigerian companies and issued with uh, SCI visas to come into the country to assume their roles. Um, post the COVID period, I also see the pandemic having a serious impact on the, um, the em employment of expatriates in Nigeria um, as um, uh, this is basically as a result of the anticipated recession and loss of our financial capacity by many companies, such that would make them sustain uh, the employment of expatriates. You know, uh, as we are all aware, uh, most organizations that require foreign skills to run their businesses often attempts to manage the personal expectations of these expatriate employees, and most times at a very high cost. So the employment comes at very enhanced terms, most times higher than the terms of employment for Nigerians. And um, there is also the cost associated with regulatory compliance, like processing of visas and SEPAC. So these costs may even double where immigration facilities are processed for the dependence of these expatriates. And then as we all know, the cost uh, is that huge and it constitutes a drain on the finances of most um, companies. So the economic effects on the pandemic will likely impact on the ability of many companies to continue to sustain these very high terms and costs of employment of expatriates. Already we have started uh, seeing some companies that have been downsizing or excising uh, their expatriate workforce, and uh, it's likely that the, the trend will continue after the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chinedu. Uh, so in summary, the critical aspects of the impact will be from the regulatory perspective and from a practical perspective, given the lockdown and the inability for uh, people to move, the shutdown of the immigration office itself. Uh, but you kind of preempted my next question to you. I hope that you will then 
briefly address that when I come back to you on the issue of um, the travel ban and how this has impacted on, on uh, permits, existing permits. Uh, but I'd like to quickly now Very ask well. Mr. Chilola uh, what he considers from an employment perspective as the greatest threat to uh, expatriate employment and how companies can uh, mitigate this threat. Well, uh, like uh, we had earlier identified, that one of the major reasons why companies even do retain expatriates uh, in the first instance is because of perceived knowledge gaps and technical uh, the need for technical uh, uh, competence, which are not readily available in Nigeria. So, for industries where these skills are not available at indigenous uh, locally then that is a big problem. Uh, and beyond that, uh, it also has significant effect on the economy itself. And, and like I earlier mentioned, uh, we are losing money as a country. For instance, the Nigeria Immigration Service generates revenue from their services uh, which they provide to, to the expatriate community. Expatriate paid visa fees, they pay SEPAC fees, that, is gone now. Uh, it was reported that last year that Nigerian Nigerian mm -hmm. service made well over 40 billion naira to the uh, federal government's uh, uh, revenue cover. And mm -hmm. that has been threatened now. So of course, with attendant uh, uh, implications for the economy. Linked to that is the loss of uh, expatriate tax revenue you can only generate tax when expatriates are within the country and engaging in productive services and earning salaries and earning their income bonuses and other benefits that emanate from their contracts. Now that uh, the expatriate community in Nigeria has dwindled significantly uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, we've seen that uh, even uh, foreign countries are coming with their aircraft, come and uh, lift their their citizens to their countries. So the expatriate community currently is, is sparse, and this has significant implication, both for the private sector that uh, retain and use their services, and also for the uh, country at large because of the value they had to the system. Thank you very much, sir. So. Uh... If I got that correctly, the summary of it yeah. is that from an employment perspective, the major threat has been the loss of revenue, both uh, from to the employer or to the employees, to the country, and of course, the regulatory agencies like the tax authority. Um, you have also touched on a question that will be coming back to you too, shortly. But very quickly now, going back to Chinedi. Chinedi, you had alluded to the issue of the fact that there will be quite a number of expatriates who have been affected by the ban on travel and the fact that they probably have expired um, entry permits or uh, visas or whatever uh, document that they, they, they hold validly. Uh, what would you say is government doing about this, the Nigerian government in this instance, and about their status uh, for those who have expired um, permits? And how will this, um, whether or not governments will be uh, penalizing uh, the, the expertise is something that I'm sure people will want to know. Could you speak to that uh, very quickly? Chinedu, you're on mute. Chinedu, you're on mute. Please oh, yeah, unmute okay. yourself, yes. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So the answer is no. Uh, the government will not be penalizing them uh, because they did not okay. uh, fully wish to overstay uh, uh, the terms of the grant of their visas in Nigeria. So as we noted earlier, the current pandemic is uh, currently impacting the ability of employers and expatriates to fulfill their obligations under the applicable laws and regulations. So one of such critical obligations is the duty not to overstay the tenure of one's visa or entry permits. So this duty is very, very sacrosanct and hardly treated with key gloves by the Nigerian Immigration Service. So often violations are met with sanctions, you know, which include payment of fines, 
you know, um, and all that. So, however, there are genuine visitors, you know, who have completed their stay and have, have wished to return to their country, countries, but who are presently unable to do so as a result of the pandemic. Um, maybe, and also uh, as a result of the travel uh, ban, you know, but thank, thankfully enough, uh, on the 15th of uh, April 2020, the federal government, through the Ministry of Interior, issued a secular to address this uh, peculiar challenge faced by this category of uh, visitors. Um, first, the secular implicitly recognized that this category of expatriates have not overstayed their visas and thus cannot be deemed to be illegal immigrants. Thus, it confers uh, legality on their continuing stay in Nigeria. Second, uh, the secular also granted a pro bono or cost-free extension of their stay, which uh, was inadvertently uh, prolonged by the unavoidable lockdown of uh, major cities and states in the country. That uh, is what we expected uh, from the government. So but it needs to be pointed out that the extension applies only to visitors and uh, migrants holding valid uh, visitors pass and residence permits with confirmed return tickets and who have also scheduled to travel out, out of Nigeria within the period of the international uh, travel restriction. So the essence of the secular is to enable, uh, uh, the essence of the window opportunity uh, is to enable the beneficiaries to schedule their flights and travel within one week of the suspension of the travel uh, restriction. However, um, uh, the, uh, for an expatriate to uh, benefit from this, um, uh, this uh, secular, uh, he or she must meet uh, certain conditions that uh, were provided herein, uh, including um, the fact that uh, that uh, uh, visa or residence permit must be valid as, and, and at, uh, up to at least the 6th of April 2020 and that uh, the visa or residence permit uh, 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 had expired during the course of the uh, lockdown or, or embargo, and that the expatriate had already purchased a valid return ticket and had scheduled a flight from Nigeria between the 6th of April 2020 and the time the travel uh, embargo is lifted. So um, once the extension is, uh, is granted, the expatriate will be uh, free to uh, exit Nigeria uh, within a period of one week from the uh, date the travel embargo is lifted. And then the, um, they must travel within a period of one week once uh, the lockdown is lifted. Uh, it should however be noted that uh, migrants and visitors whose permits or visitors pass expired before the restriction order uh, are exempted, will not be able to benefit from this uh, window of opportunity as they must uh, pay the applicable uh, fee and, and penalty you know, for overstaying their visas. So uh, the answer is yes. Uh, such expatriates that are currently unable to travel as a result of the travel ban would not be made to pay any fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chinidu. So essentially, uh, the government is not is not considering those who have been affected by this event illegal in terms of their status here in Nigeria. That's the story yes. of what you were just yes, explained. Of course, yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so going back to Mr. Tilola, I have a very critical question, and I'm sure that this is something that is on the top of the minds of every employee, every employer, rather, and um, not only an employer of expatriates, but an employer of labor in Nigeria. And that's the issue of the enforceability of contracts of employment in Nigeria, uh, given the impact of uh, COVID-19 and the impact that's had on business and operations. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Atila, my question to you is, do you foresee uh, the possibility of breaches or non-performance arising from the current pandemic? And how, what's your view on the possibility of contract of employment generally in Nigeria? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, moderator. Clearly, uh, the, the, the current COVID-19 uh, crisis is beginning to have significant impact on employment relationships. And this has uh, become a major challenge to human resources managers and employers of labor. And you see, because the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the pandemic, because it's novel, uh, I tell people this generation has not seen this before. Uh, even for some of us who are in our 40s and early 50s, even our parents, 
did not witness this, were told that the last was in 1918. So this is a novel situation that people are not used to and organizations are beginning to, to I mean, invoke options and consider options that they can use to address this. Now, in the last few weeks, we've read in the papers, we've gathered on the social media and other sources that organizations are beginning to use various measures as a response to this COVID-19 challenge, especially the rising and accumulating labor cost. People are unable to come to work and yet we have salary uh, obligations. Uh, whether the employment is for expatriates or for indigenous people, uh, the law of employment is the same. So what we have seen here is that there are a lot of breaches going on uh, we've heard of organizations adopting, compelling their employees to use this period as a, a their annual leave uh, with pay. And the question I always say that can you uh, have annual leave during period of restrictions on local and global mobility? Secondly, I've also drawn the attention of some people to the fact that now that you have asked people to proceed on their annual leave with pay, I hope you have also created the account with their annual leave allowance because it comes with it. We have also had cases of unilateral reduction in working hours and unilateral pay cuts being carried out by employers. In labor and employment law, contract of employment is mutual and that's what is called sanctity of contract. No party is eligible or is allowed to on its own, very terms and conditions of employment. You cannot do that. So before you can vary terms and conditions of employment, both parties must agree. Now, meaning that whether for expatriates or for uh, indigenous employees, then you must engage and secure the consent of the parties before you can have changes. Contract of employment is a product of the agreement of parties and for you to also amend it, both parties also need to come to table. So let me come from two perspectives. For local employees, if the company is unionized, that even makes it a bit easier because there is a forum for collective discussions. We call it collective uh, uh, bargaining, where the employers and the unions can come. Employers will present their challenges, the figures, uh, uh, and seek the, uh, the indulgence of the union to have the contract reviewed. And once the union agrees and it is signed off by way of a collective bargaining agreement, that becomes binding and lawful on the employees who are members of the union. This is because in labor and employment law and industrial relations, trade unions are considered to be the collective bargaining agent of the workers. And they have the authority to proceed to negotiate terms and conditions of employment. And in any case, remember, that some of the terms and conditions that employees enjoy in the unionized environment is itself a product of collective bargaining agreement. We can be varied by another collective bargaining agreement. But if the company is not uh, unionized, then for indigenous staff, you have to go by way of what is, what is called, uh, uh, I mean, employee engagement. I have suggested in the past that in a situation like this, we can resort to what is called the use of employees consultative forum, otherwise called employees joint consultative council. This is a forum where employees representatives come together and they have the mandate of their colleagues to discuss with management. It's not the same thing as a trade union, but they perform a similar role. So in a situation like this, management can engage uh, their non-union staff. Even where you are unionized, managers are not unionized. And some, and some degrees and some staff of certain level in the company. So those ones, you can engage collectively through the instrument of what is called employee consultative forum. And with that, you can engage and, uh, and come up with mutually accepted uh, uh, agreement. Now, whether they are as per expatriates, well, there is no law that says expatriates too cannot be brought to the table to discuss. Uh, but for expatriate employees, they, they are something called expatriate policy, otherwise called uh, long-term international assignment policy, which contains a lot of terms regulating expatriate employment. 
if you look at your expatriate policy and you are lucky to have what is called a force major clause, then you can invoke it. In labor and employment law, a force major is a contractual term that is inserted into the contract to the effect that in the event of an act of God, a specified act of God, be it pandemics, epidemics, uh, war, riot, insurrection, uh, flood, hurricane, etc., cetera, et cetera, the parties are at liberty to either terminate the contract or suspend the obligations of the parties. But what a lot of what a lot of people don't know about force major is that you cannot invoke you cannot invoke a force major clause unless that clause is specifically provided either in the contract of employment, expatriate policy for expatriates, collective bargaining agreement for unionized staff, or employee handbook of indigenous staff. Meaning that in the absence of a force major clause in any of these employment documents, you cannot invoke it. Now, a force major is usually a precise contractual term in the sense that it states clearly the events that will qualify as force major. And once the event in question, which you want to rely on to invoke the clause, once that event is not included in the events that you have identified in your force major clause, then you can, use, you can invoke it. So I give you an example. If your force major clause does not talk about epidemics and pandemics, and it talks about war, hurricane, flood, and uh, riot and insurrection, and it ends there, you cannot invoke force major. But there are some omnibus clauses, which if used, even where pandemic or epidemic is not mentioned that you can rely on it. For instance, if the clause says flood, war, insurrection, uh, riots, and other act of God. Act of God, that omnibus clause can accommodate pandemics like COVID-19 because act of God means things beyond the contemplation or control of both parties. And of course, COVID-19 will qualify as one. Or your first major clause ends with a clause like and other events beyond the control of the parties, then that can come in. But in the absence of that, because the force major clause is a contractual term, the event must be provided in need. Then next to this is the issue of uh, the effect of a force major. The force major clause will not only define what constitutes force major under that contract, it will go further to state the effect. And the effect is whatever the, guard, the parties agree to be the effect. So it could be termination and it could be suspension of mutual obligations, which includes obligation to pay uh, salary. So uh, clearly, whether for expatriate employees or for local and indigenous employees, uh, the if what we read in the social media and what we gather around, including from families and friends, is anything to go to go by, there is a lot of breaches going on currently, and there is a lot of unfair labor practices. Uh, going on currently, you, you don't sit down on employee salary and say, I'm not going to pay you because there is no work. There is no such power. However, one thing I did not address, which is a corollary to force my job, is what is called the common law doctrine of frustration. That's what is called frustration in contracts. The doctrine of frustration is a common law doctrine which, re, which you can rely on even in the absence of any formal provision, either in the product of employment or employee handbook or whatever. So, but frustration is much more difficult to rely on because the requirement of the law is that before an event can be said to have frustrated a contract, it must be an event not contemplated by both parties and which event has rendered the continuation of that contract to be totally impossible. So if the event is such that renders the continuation of the contract to be difficult or to be more expensive or brings more inconvenience, that will not constitute frustration. Because what the common law doctrine of frustration insists on is that it must be a total 
case of inability to proceed. Now, now let's put it within context. If you are in, uh, let's say, in the manufacturing sector, and you are manufacturing uh, FMCG fast moving consumer goods, uh, which are consumables, and which under the COVID-19 guidelines, federal government has said they are they are considered as essentials, which can move around, meaning that the employees can move around, or you are, pro you are into production of beverages or food. Even though your market is shrinking or has shrinked, but you are still in business. Even though employees may not be able to deliver optimally, but they still come to work, uh, maybe, maybe if it is nine to three, or, or even your salesman can no longer cover the entire Nigeria, they now cover Lagos because of money. You cannot rely on frustration because the contract has only made more difficult you are not getting the optimal value from it, but yet the contract is still on. Or it is a kind of work that can be done from home. An accountant, for instance, payments are still being received, payments are still being made. An HR manager can work from home, an accountant can work from home, an IT professional can work from home, even though there may not be optimal performance or there is no sufficient business to engage them, but there is still performance. So, on that basis, you cannot rely on common law doctrine of frustration. So you can see that for those that have force major clauses, it is much easier to invoke it because parties have put it in there, provided the event in question, which is COVID-19, is contemplated or expressly provided under that force major. But for you to invoke the common law doctrine of frustration, it must be a total case of inability to perform. A good example. Let's say we employ a, a company employ a German or a few Germans as employees. And uh, uh, for instance, let's say there is a diplomatic friction between Federal Republic of Nigeria and Germany. And government says all Germans should leave the country because of the diplomatic uh, hostility. By that singular event, no German is allowed to stay in Nigeria. So that contract is frustrated because it is totally impossible. Or there is war. If, for instance, as we talk, if many years ago, an American is employed, let's say 10 years ago, is employed as a project manager in Maiduguri, in Bono State. In the last four years, because of the uh, insecurity crisis in that part of Nigeria, that contract can be said to have been frustrated because no expatriates, especially people from America, Europe, or other but can work in that region. So clearly, there are a lot of breaches going on in an attempt to mitigate uh, the financial risk, to reduce the labor cost. Uh, but again, it is important that we comply with the law in carrying out some of these measures. So I hope I've been able to address some of the very, very thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think that was a very, uh, you broke down the issues very clearly. Uh, so essentially, in summary, what we have said is that uh, there really is very little leeway for uh, employers to uh, vary the terms of existing contracts. And that uh, to be able to do so at all, they need to engage and negotiate through whatever forum that is relevant to their industry, the employers, employees consultative forum or the union, uh, union based uh, uh, forums. And for expatriates, the, the same principles apply and they can be engaged directly. Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, I'm sure that this is a burning issue on the minds and the tables and the boards of almost every company in Nigeria. We hope that companies will be proactive and. Um, would have sought legal advice before implementing whatever decisions they are, they are taking. Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, Chime, be very quickly to you now. Um, given the exodus that we have witnessed with expatriates um, um, following the outbreak of the, of the pandemic, uh, how would you say this would impact on the immigration service, on the Nigerian immigration service? Yeah, I'll mute again. I will, I will make the mistake again. 
<laughs> you almost did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, um, so as you rightly said, the pandemic uh, has resulted uh, in the repatriation and exit of, um, of expatriates from Nigeria. So the exits we are currently witnessing is, uh, is in three forms. You know, so there is uh, um, there are expatriates uh, who chose to exit the country before the lockdown for their home countries due to the perceived um, perceived or alleged poor state of our health care infrastructure, uh, lack of supplies uh, such as medical equipment, ventilators, um, isolation centers uh, that will be needed. You know, uh, to fight the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, some experts in this class uh, who we were opportunity to interact uh, before they exited uh, the country expressed uh, their preference for health systems in their home countries uh, to what is obtainable in Nigeria. Uh, even some insinuated uh, that uh, in the event of a full pandemic, it is likely that the Nigerian government will uh, place more premium on saving the lives of uh, Nigerians than those of the foreigners. Um, however, as we have seen, the actions of the federal government uh, particularly uh, that of the Lagos State government have proved uh, that fear to be displaced as uh, care is currently extended to uh, everyone regardless of their nationality. So another group of people that have existed uh, uh, in this country is um, uh, expatriates who have been repatriated from Nigeria by their home countries. For example, the U.S. State Department, uh, Department which announced that Americans should not travel outside of the country and even went ahead to even uh, uh, return some of their expatriates uh, uh, from Nigeria. So the recent repatriation of Israelis, Americans, and British citizens from Nigeria is quite instructive here, and um, certainly uh, impacts on the um, activities of the Nigerian Immigration Service. Uh, coincidentally, too, uh, gladly too, uh, Nigeria is also putting in, in place measures to also repatriate its citizens from other countries in response to the uh, socioeconomic situation in those countries. So the last group of people that have existed uh, uh, constitute expatriates whose, um, uh, whose employment uh, have abated as a result of the declaration of the redundancy uh, 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 for several positions. Uh, so as we know, some companies have uh, 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 started downsizing or resizing uh, their expatriate workforce. Some of them, we are lucky to exit the country before uh, the uh, commencement of the lockdown. So those are the three group of expatriates that have existed uh, in Nigeria. Um, it's also instructive to know that some of these expatriates may never return to the country again, or it may take a very long time before they consider returning to the country. Uh, people have said that the pandemic of this nature takes at least two years to clear. You know, uh, so it is uh, expected that some of these expatriates might not come back to Nigeria uh, for a very uh, uh, long period of time. So this will certainly impact on the revenue of the uh, Nigerian Immigration Service as a major chunk of their income is derived from the sales of um, um, setback and other immigration permits. Um, like uh, Atidola just said, uh, uh, the Nigerian Immigration Service made roughly 40 uh, billion naira from the sale of immigration uh, permits like uh, SEPAC and all that. You know, figures that we, 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 that we uh, uh, collected from the Bureau of Statistics indicated that last uh, uh, 2018 alone, uh, the immigration service made roughly 39.6 billion naira. Then 2019, they made more than 40 billion naira. So, um, and of this 39 billion naira that was generated, the sales of SEPAC accounted for 20 billion or an average of 70 billion of immigration global um, revenue. So this shows that the sale of SEPA, for example, just one item, you know, will uh, impact on the revenue of the Nigerian uh, immigration. So we're seeing that uh, it will have serious impact on their revenue generation um, capacity. And um, also, we also envisage that uh, in an attempt by the immigration service to uh, make up for the shortfall in revenue uh, due to the exits or the exodus of expatriates, uh, there will be a strict enforcement of the provisions of the Immigration Act and regulations and um, churning up, uh, to shore up East revenue. You know, uh, uh, particularly we see that the Immigration Service will likely start enforcing some specific um, provisions of the Immigration Act, which hitherto they have neglected. And, I, and as we all know, um, uh, penalties accruing from such enforcement uh, exercises 
will also add up to the uh, global revenue of the uh, immigration service at the end of the day. And um, some people have also said that um, another impact that the exodus uh, occasioned by the pandemic will have on the NIS is that it will likely make them to rethink their processes and uh, modus operandi. So analysts are suggesting that uh, the immigration process uh, should ordinarily match the speed of technology and innovation, and are suggesting that the NIS should further automate its process, such as uh, expatriates and visitors would have easy um, access to immigration facilities without necessarily going through what some describe as harrowing experiences in the visa uh, issuing process. So people are indeed looking forward to the issuance of and um, process of e sepac for example, and other payments such that, such that will make uh, immigration uh, experience in Nigeria less cumbersome. So we have the revenue aspect, which we know uh, will really uh, affect the Nigerian immigration service. I also know that uh, to show up the revenue, they are going to uh, commence strict enforcement of uh, immigration um, uh, provisions and regulations. And um, uh, we also are looking forward to that uh, they will likely change their processes to automate uh, their process. So furthermore, it is also likely that the NIS will tighten uh, its monitoring activities to curb certain immigration practice, which pose a significant threat to its revenue generating capacity. And um, to ensure that uh, companies and expatriates uh, play strictly uh, by the rule so one of such practices is quota trafficking, which uh, usually occurs uh, in different forms, uh, part of which where a company to whom an, approval, uh, an approved quota has been issued uses that quota to admit expatriates uh, for other uh, companies. So generally, we we'll look at, uh, we we'll say that the, because of the uh, perceived or the anticipated uh, fall in the revenue of the Nigerian immigration service, that different measures will be put in place by, uh, by the service to stem the tide. Thank you very much, Junidu. Uh, so essentially, it's more like a two-edged uh, sword, uh, both positives and negatives. So the major negative will be the impact on the NIS in terms in the area of revenues, and uh, but and then on the flip side, uh, hopefully, uh, the experience will galvanize the um, service to revamp its uh, processes. Hopefully, uh, we hopefully that will um, will materialize. Uh, thank you very much, Inidi. You spoke on an issue that uh, I would like Mr. Tilola to now speak on you. you rather, you, you, you brought up an issue. You mentioned the word downsizing as you were speaking on the issue of, uh, of employment and how many companies are currently downsizing. Uh, so, Mr. Tilola, my question to you is uh, what the impact or the legality of downsizing is. So, you spoke extensively earlier on the... Uh, the contract of employment itself and how uh, employers can navigate around varying the terms legally. Uh, so could you speak briefly on the issue of downsizing and the legality of, of, of this concept and what initiatives employers can take uh, on this matter? Uh, thank you, uh, moderator. In labor and employment law, uh, Downsizing, right sizing, etc., are, are legitimate uh, uh, decisions in the hand of employer. Uh, in labor and employment law, we call it redundancy. Uh, yeah, redundancy is defined under the Labor Act as involuntary loss of employment uh, due to excess manpower. So it's a situation where you discharge your excess manpower. Uh, and this, I mean, can be as a result of different reasons, including declining uh, business fortunes. It could be like COVID-19 that we are unable to get businesses, organizations are unable to perform optimally. It could even be simple change in your, in your production system, closure of a branch or a production line, or even automation processes. When you automate your process, you replace uh, manpower with technology. Of course, there is a reduced need for labor. So labor and employment law understands that there could be a situation where there is a declining need for labor. You may have 50 workers today, and tomorrow something happens. You lost a major client, you lost a major contract, or there is uh, uh, 
an event beyond our control like COVID-19, you can no longer keep those staff. Section 20 of the Labor Act deals with redundancy and says where there is excess manpower, employers can actually shed weight. However, Section 20 makes provision for some procedures. So the starting point here is that you can actually downsize using the device of redundancy. However, there are procedures that you must follow to make it lawful. Section 20 of Labor Act says, first, once you declare redundancy, you must inform the employees directly if they are not unionized. And if they are unionized, you must inform their respective trade unions. And the purpose uh, is to bring them to the table to discuss. This we call duty to inform and the duty of consultation. It is expected that you do a letter to them, letting them know your challenges, what the outlook used to be, what it is now that you have, and the number of employees that you intend to, uh, to discharge. The basis of this number, uh, why it is more in this department than the other department, and the total number of the employees you intend. So for their own consideration. Once you do that, that has the next obligation, which is obligation to pay redundancy pay. Now, how is redundancy pay determined under Nigerian law? Unfortunately, under the Labor Act, unlike under the English legislations, where you have a table stating what is payable for each number of years worked. In Nigeria, the Labor Act, Section 20, simply says, that employers should endeavor to pay redundancy payments. Meaning that we have to use collective uh, bargaining to arrive at what is payable. However, some organizations have moved beyond this. I know of organizations that in their employee handbook, they have a chapter for redundancy, which chapter has, has defined what is payable to workers in the event of redundancy for every year worked. Some will say from year five to 10 years, you have one month salary for every year worked. If you have done 15 years, two months salary for every year worked. If you have done 20 years and above, six weeks salary for every year worked. So if you have that provision, it's much easier because by contractual agreement in the employee handbook, which is deemed to be an integral part of the product of employment of employees, you invoke that clause and you say to them, and everybody is fine. And nobody can challenge that because uh, redundancy is, it refers to economic termination of employment. It's a situation where uh, it's beyond your control. And the law recognizes that we could actually find ourselves in such circumstances. The other option is for unionized businesses. A common provision in the collective bargaining agreement which they have signed is usually a redundancy clause which provides for a similar table of payment of redundancy pay whenever that redundancy is triggered. Like employee handbook, the CBA may also provide for the table of payment this month of uh, two month salary for every year work or six week salary for every year work. The only challenge is where the company is not unionized and there is no provision in the employee and the parties mm -hmm. have to come to the and, that they, and this can take uh, a, a, a much longer period of compared to where this has been reduced to writing. Now, another rider to this, as we know, the Labor Act 20 has no application to senior and management staff. Section 91 of the Labor Act makes it clear that the Labor Act has no application to anybody exercising administrative, executive, and management functions, meaning that the Act applies only to junior workers. Now, for managers and above, who also, under the law, do not unionize, that means they cannot also invoke the provisions of collective bargaining agreement. So with me, the only option available to them is to seek recourse and relief either in their contract of employment, if there is a provision for what is paid as redundancy, or go to 
the company's employee handbook if there is such provision. And if there is none, then they have to engage uh, their management on what is payable and in respect of which an agreement can be uh, can be reached. So basically, uh, what is happening currently uh, is contemplated in labor and employment law. The law knows that we could have this situation. The law provides for it. It's a tool in the hands of employers uh, to respond to situations like this. It is a legitimate option available to employers. They can use it. However, they must comply with the relevant procedure, including payment of redundancy pay. Thank you very much, sir. That was quite useful. So um, my understanding is that absent the existence of the relevant provisions in the handbook and the contract of employment, uh, what the law has done is that it has left the decision around uh, what is payable as redundancy pay to the discretion of the contracting parties. And essentially, we know that the, the contracting parties here, being the employer and the employee, we know then that the employer will then put terms which the employee, if he's uh, in a difficult position, is likely to accept. So essentially, the law has given power to the employer to come to terms with the employee regarding what is payable as we don't have to pay. Okay, thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, Chine, the moving quickly to you now, you had alluded to a few of the um, reforms that we will potentially see following the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, let's hope, eradication of the pandemic uh, with the uh, Nigerian Immigration Service and potentially the federal government. Uh, what other remedial actions do you think the government is going to take uh, on trying to help uh, employment of expatriates or addressing the issue of expatriate employment in Nigeria? Okay, so, um, so um, uh, there is no gain saying that the pandemic uh, uh, is currently exerting a serious uh, pressure on the economy and has also led to the loss of jobs Many Nigerians. Um, we daily we hear about um, uh, people being uh, placed on redundancy, you know, um, salaries being cut, and all that. All these are, are some one way or the other connected to the current um, pandemic. And as a responsible government, uh, there's no way that the, uh, the government will sit idle and um, allow um, uh, its uh, growing uh, population to remain unemployed. So to address this problem, there is uh, likely to be increased government effort to create employment for Nigerians. Um, and one important step that the government is likely to take to achieve this is to uh, uh, conduct uh, audits you know, of job positions currently occupied by expatriates uh, in order to free up uh, uh, jobs for Nigerians. Um, you know, Nigerians have continued to uh, observe uh, the, that the unmitigated influx of unqualified expatriates and their placements on expatriate quota slots for which there are abundant uh, local manpower resources has continued to contribute to the uh, rising unemployment figures we have in the country. So it is likely that the government will um, emphasize, will look at, you know, um, expatriate employment in Nigeria, you know, um, to, uh, to confirm, uh, to be sure that uh, uh, employers are, are abiding by the spirit and letter of, um, of uh, the Immigration Act and the underlining uh, principles. So emphasis will likely uh, be focused on expatriates who are employed in job roles where there is a confirmed abundance of local talents and skills. You know, also expatriates whose skill sets or qualification do not align with their respective job designations or on the lining quota may also be affected once the government um, likely commences uh, this initiative. So it is expected that the, uh, the scrutiny uh, 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 will, will be intensified in the entire value of the expatriate employment uh, chain, particularly at the embassies. Uh, firstly, we have applications for SCR visas are submitted, you know, and then at the Nigerian Immigration Service uh, headquarters, we have uh, SCR visas are regularized. So uh, the officers will. Uh, probably want to look 
at the qualification of those expatriates to ensure that they align with the uh, uh, designated job uh, job positions. So this scrutiny will uh, will, will uh, and verification will also uh, intensify uh, during the monitoring process of the Nigerian Immigration Service. Uh, they are allowed to uh, conduct uh, on scheduled visits to companies to confirm their compliance with uh, with uh, the immigration uh, regulations. So. Um, Again, I also see uh, government placing um, emphasis on the on the study development. Uh, one of the conditions for the issuance of expatriate quota um, certificates is the requirement that uh, beneficiary companies must employ two Nigerians to understudy uh, those expatriates. Uh, the essence is that uh, uh, to enable uh, the Nigerians to acquire the skills for which those expatriates were employed in the first place. And then uh, uh, look at the possibility of those Nigerians vying for those posts in the nearest future. Uh, 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 but sadly, these uh, requirements of the law has uh, always been obeyed in the breach. So it's likely that government will pre uh, uh, put their satellite on the compliance level of companies to ensure that Nigerian employees are employed by those companies who uh, have benefited from the expatriate quota uh, regime. I also see a restriction, a possible restriction on the issuance of expatriate quota by the federal government, you know, in an attempt to, um, to uh, show up the employment uh, uh, rates for Nigerians. So there's already a recommendation to the federal government to review the current expatriate quota system at the end of the current pandemic. Uh, the cause of this recommendation is to prevent the exertion of unnecessary pressure on the social system and to also uh, protect uh, the jobs of Nigerians. So if government takes this recommendation, it's likely that several restrictions will be placed by the Federal Ministry of Interior to reduce the grant of expatriate quota and limit the approvals to only applications that will add value in the short to medium term to enable the company to substantially recover from the impact of the uh, pandemic. So some of these measures might include outright denial of expatriate quota for some industries, uh, the reduction in number of quota approvals per company, and also the requirements for higher qualifications for uh, companies wishing to place um, expatriates on their quotas. So I also envisage that the Nigerian immigration service also increase their, their monitoring activities, uh, particularly to stem the tide of quota trafficking, uh, as you have mentioned. So um, if uh, the government takes some of these recommendations, I, I'm sure it's going to impact on um, the continuing employment of some expatriates in Nigeria, and also um, assist in um, um, shoring up employment conditions for Nigerians. Thank you very much, Timothy. My understanding of uh, your explanation on the on, on the issue is that uh, the impact is likely going to be in the area of stricter a, a stricter regulatory regime uh, in, yes. this, in the immigration sector. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, very quickly now, I'll move on to Mr. Tilola. Um, Mr. Tilola, you have spoken quite extensively on the issue of. Uh, the, the contract of employment uh, and how uh, employers can navigate around um, varying the terms during this uh, period that we're this situation that we are in. So I'd like you to speak very briefly to the issue of um, the potential fact that some contracts, particularly now speaking to expatriates, some expatriate contracts may have expired during the dependency of the lockdown and the employers are willing to renew, given the implications uh, for them uh, in the area of the, the financial obligations of renewing those contracts. What would you say those companies can do practically? Do you think that um, the law, well, the, the, the expert rate can validly expect to be remunerated during this period? And if not, what is the what does the labor law say uh, on situations uh, like this? Well, uh, thank you once more. I think I've addressed some of these issues uh, earlier. You have indeed. Yeah. Uh, in, in in you see, one thing thing about contract of employment is that the bedrock is the agreement of the parties. Uh, contract of employment defines steps and conditions that are agreed by parties 
including the salary, the working hours, and the issue of expiration of contract of employment. This that will arise where the contract is for a fixed term. So, where the contract is for a fixed term, mm. uh, the law is that upon the expiration of that contract, or, or I mean of that fixed term, that contract stands terminated by a fluctuation of time. So, if the contract is for two years certain, renewable at the instance of both parties, then upon the expiration of two years, all the contract stands terminated and all the rights and obligations under it cease to exist. It is now at the liberty of the employer to now extend to you another uh, 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 invitation that please, I want this contract renewed by another six months, another two years, another one year. And which application or extension the employee is also at liberty to accept or to reject. So if an employer is lucky that he has expatriate employees in his service, those expatriate have left for their country because of the COVID-19 crisis, and you don't have a need for them currently because, uh, because we are under lockdown, then your, your, your problem is, 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 is minimized. You will simply invoke that clause and advise uh, the, the expatriate that you will recall that your contract of employment with us expires and so, so, and so, so. Please know that management will, will not uh, be renewing this uh, contract of employment. So we thank you uh, for your services to the company and it ends there. So that shouldn't, but again, I thought uh, we should be, and maybe, maybe you have further questions uh, in, I mean, uh, later to ask. I thought we should be asking now, what are the mitigation steps that we can take now in future contract of employment to address events like COVID-19? I have, I have to be honest with you, a lot of employers of labor are unprepared uh, for this for this COVID. Uh, they that are was going to be my last question. That was going to be my last question to you. So if I don't know so, if you can so hold up for a second. Back to, so so for for contracts that are that have expired, you are at yeah. liberty whether to renew it or not or to not. renew it. But there is a but, but there's another side to it. If you are willing to renew. For instance, as we operate, the COVID crisis is over, let's say in May or June. And that contract is uh, 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 expiring just about the same time. And mm -hmm. there is a need for that role, or there is a continuous need for that role, and we want to extend the contract. The question that we arise is that even immediately after the COVID, are expatriates willing to take the risk? To come to Nigeria, these are challenges. I can I can tell you that one of the major reasons why most expatriates left shortly before the shutdown or during the uh, the lockdown uh, was because of the perceived poor health facilities in Nigeria. Now, again, if a contract expires, let's say today. And there is still a continuous need for that expatriate. Even where is work permit and uh, SEPAC and everything are in order and they are still valid. The airports are closed. So there is even a problem of mobility. It cannot come in. Even where you, where you are willing to renew today, it cannot come in because the, 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 the international airports are closed. If he has visas, it cannot come in. Then even we are in uh, work permits and, and expatriate quotas, et cetera, where they, have, uh, uh, where they are expired, the immigration service is currently shut down. And like my, my colleague has said, that even where you apply uh, online for renewals, there's nobody to attend to it. So these are challenges that, that uh, we are going to have as employers of expatriate even where you are willing to renew their contracts, even where they are also willing to come to Nigeria. 
Thank you very much, sir. And again, uh, you have preempted my next question to you. The question I was going to ask was that given the travel ban and the fact that there are more likely to be additional changes and with restrictions regarding air travels particularly, uh, would you say that employers who have engaged or hired expatriates before the outbreak of the pandemic, would you say that they, would, they can legally now vary the terms or terminate the contract that they have issued or signed with the expatriates because the expatriates are unable to travel back to Nigeria to resume work? Yes. Uh, well, that is equally very straightforward and can be professionally managed. Let's look at the following scenarios. The first scenario okay. is where you have been issued a contract of employment or your contract has been renewed and you are due to come. First and foremost, because of the lockdown and closure of international airports, you cannot come into Nigeria. So the first step for the employer to do is to audit the relevant documentations within. Is there a force major clause? If there are risks, you can invoke it to suspend the contract. A force major can give parties the power to suspend the contract. The contract is not terminated, but pending when this issue is resolved, mutual obligations of working for me and of me paying you salaries uh, 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 is, is suspended. That is option one. Option two, I've explained the, the common law doctrine of frustration. Uh, uh, happily, Nigeria is a common law so that can be even where there is no such loss. But I've, I've explained earlier that it's much more difficult to invoke the doctrine of frustration because it must be shown that there is total inability to, uh, to, to consummate or to continue the contract, which is not difficult to prove here. If I'm a Canadian, I'm in Canada, all the airports are closed. So what do I do? Or my expatriate quotas or my work permits is being processed, and it was anticipated that by this, by the commencement of the contract, you try, the all processing will have been completed, but you don't have it. Even if you have it, you cannot come in. So that is a clear case of frustration of contract of employment. Then lastly, remember that every contract of employment has a termination clause, saying either party is at liberty to terminate this contract of employment by giving either one more notice or payment in lieu of notice. The only implication. That's correct. Hello, Mr. Tilola, can you hear me? Hello. Accounts that will be available in such circumstance. We lost you for a second. I, I want to believe that uh, it was probably my network and that. The audience had your last comments on the last option. Yes. Uh, so you, you had alluded briefly to the issue of the uh, plans that companies can take post COVID-19 regarding contracts of employment. But I'd like you to speak briefly, particularly as it relates to expatriates. So generally, contracts of employment, what action plans can companies begin to put in place to mitigate a potential Hopefully not, but a potential, you know, reoccurrence if in, the, in the unlikely event that we are dealing with a situation that is not um, an unforeseen situation. How would you say companies can proactively now take steps to address uh, this going forward? Now, you, uh, you honestly, you have asked uh, what I consider one of the most important questions in this session. We are in COVID-19 crisis. We have no control over that yet. But we can plan against uh, future occurrences, uh, which we are not praying for. Uh, nobody prayed for this, but we are in it. So uh, the, the, the issue becomes, how do we uh, proactively organize ourselves as employers of labor to respond to future challenges that may be similar to uh, COVID-19, because whether we like it or not, COVID-19 has taught us new lessons in crisis management. Now, the, the first step to take is that employers of labor must audit 
their entire employment processes. One, audit your expatriate contract and expatriate policies and check, one, is there a force major clause? Because uh, in the last few weeks, when people want to know uh, whether they can do force major or frustration, the first thing we tell them, go and check your contract of employment and employee and do. And they come back to you and tell you, we are sorry, there's no such, con there's no such clause. The reason why such clause is not popular in Nigeria is because uh, 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 we are so blessed that we don't witness uh, uh, natural disasters here. In some times, hurricane, flood is not an unusual event. So the contract of employment anticipate it and, and, and make provision for it. But in Nigeria, I mean, uh, we have been so blessed. We, like I said, we have never witnessed this before. So we forget or we consider it not important to have such uh, clauses. So I expect that human resource managers and top management will carry out a review of the employment process, first and foremost, the contract of employment. The template should be amended to include a first major clause. You may never have cause to use them or to invoke them throughout the employment of such staff, but you have it in place, should you have a need to invoke it, you invoke it. Then you move to the employee handbook. You also incorporate a four major clause to the effect that in the event of war, uh, uh, crisis, riot, pandemics, epidemics, flood, riot or insurrection, the parties should be at liberty to suspend the contract because as we are now, if all the contracts in employment, if all the contracts of employment in Nigeria has a force major clause, employers will not be complaining. We'll simply invoke it and tell you that, look, why this COVID-19 uh, 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 continues, I will be discharged of my obligation. Please refer to clause nine of your contract of employment. Although it has adverse implications for employees and people during crisis, they need, but Again, it is a provision which the law allows. For expatriate em employment, it is important that the contract of employment of expatriates or the expatriate policy, which is a bigger document, uh, which contains several other terms of engagement, you also include a first major clause uh, in such a contract of employment. Then secondly, there have also been concerns about companies who have need to engage employees who are supposed to resume, for instance, let's say by June 1. There is a vacancy now which we intend to fill by June 1st. The contract of employment is still being drafted. We have not issued it. But nobody is sure whether by June 1st, whether the lockdown will be over, whether we'll be allowed to work, whether the employee will be in position to come to work and deliver value uh, for which is being contracted. So issues have arise, questions have arise as to what can we do in such circumstances? Because, uh, and the issue is very complex. If somebody works with company A as a chief accountant and company B offers him employment as CFO, as the chief financial officer of their company to resume on June 1. It is expected that for him to resume, he has to resign where he is and give them notice. Now, when he resigns and he comes on June 1, and you are now looking at him and say, ah, uh, bros, you know, when we issued this contract, we thought uh, COVID will have been no problem. Unfortunately, we are unable to absorb it. That is clearly a breach of contract. What we can do here is that if you have some situation where you currently need to issue contract of employment, where the employee is intended to resume, let's say next, let's say in June, June 1st or August 1st, for instance, and because we cannot certainly say the future of this COVID-19 in Nigeria in another one, two, three, four months. So if you write, if you prepare your contract of employment and say your resumption date shall be June 1st, 2020. You can put a proviso, provided, however, 
that this redemption date or this contract of employment shall not be effect, shall not take effect in the event that the current COVID-19 pandemic as is, 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 uh, continues. So in law, a professor is allowed. And once the employee signs it, the meaning is that he has considered the implication of that and he takes the contract as a whole. And the issue of breach of contract will not arise if by June 1, you are, you are unable to take him in. So meaning that before he resigns his current contract of employment, he will also consider that clause and make up his mind whether it is a chance he's willing to take or not. So basically, uh, it is important that we, we, we audit our employment processes, uh, our documentations, and we, uh, because like I said, COVID-19 has taught us new lessons in crisis management and workplace, and uh, this is the time uh, uh, to do the right thing. Uh, one month, I, I cannot overemphasize that organizations that intend to take measures in response to the COVID-19 should be very careful and seek appropriate legal advice from competent professionals. Because in an attempt to, to manage or reduce your financial risk, you may end up in, the, I mean, in, in, in finding yourself in bigger trouble. Because if you take, the, if you take steps that are unlawful, or wrongful or violative of employees' rights, when the COVID-19 is over, I mean, the possibility of class action is there. For you have a decision where 200 employees will file a class action at the National Industrial Court and begin to embarrass you uh, all over the place with that suit. So it is important that before we take any step, any legal step, any measure in response to this crisis, seek legal advice, from the lawyers and consider the reputational risk that such decisions may cause you as an organization. Uh, thank you very much for that, sir. Um, I think that any employer of labor uh, who is currently participating on the webinar will be clear about the practical steps that they need to take post uh, the pandemic, uh, hopefully, we also have some HR practitioners uh, on the webinar. Thank you very much for that, sir. We have a few questions from participants that I would like to quickly share so that uh, you and Ginny uh, can quickly address those uh, before we take your final comments on, the, uh, on any particular issue that you would like to uh, speak to before we come to an end of the webinar. So we have a question here from, um, BC Ademi, and her question is to you, Mr. Uh, Atilola. She's, she's asking, how common are force major clauses in contracts of employment? And also whether COVID-19 uh, presents a ground for declaring redundancy under the act. I believe you actually spoke a bit to that issue much earlier when we we're talking about um, the redundancy and uh, uh, downsizing. She also would like you to clarify which category of employees the Labor Act specifically relates to. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the first question uh, I mentioned, uh, I mean, I touched it in the course of my presentation, but let me do a brief overview again. From my experience uh, as a labor and employment lawyer, First, my job clauses are not common in contract of employment. We find them more in commercial agreements. In fact, uh, out of free 100 contract of employment in Nigeria, it will be, I doubt if you can find five that we have forced by job clauses. And like, and like I said, it's a reflection uh, of our environment. Uh, because a typical force major clauses recite events like war, hurricane, earthquake, flood. These are natural disasters that uh, we don't have in this part of the world. So it has not it has not formed part of our experience, and and as such, uh, 
uh, it is not a common practice to have it in product of employment. Uh, the reason why we have it in commercial agreement because it has become a standard format uh, uh, used uh, globally uh, for, uh, uh, for, for contracts, standard templates. So it, it, it is not common. Then two, I think I've answered the, the first part. The, the, the second part relates to the applicability of the Labor Act. The Labor Act is the principal legislation regulating labor and employment in Nigeria. And by the express provision of section 91 of the Labor Act, which is the interpretation section, it says the, the word worker, which is the language used throughout the, the provisions of the act, that the word worker does not include anyone exercising administrative, executive, and management functions. And this provision has been interpreted to mean that the Labor Act applies to junior staff. So this follows that a director, for instance, a general manager, for instance, a senior manager, for instance, a manager, for instance, cannot invoke the provisions of labor acts uh, to ventilate uh, 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 any grievance in the court of law. The, the matter will be dismissed. So for this category of staff who are, who are junior employees, clerks and those uh, low cadre employees, they can, they can invoke provisions of labor act. But for senior staff, managers, directors, managing directors, etc. You either have recourse to the company's employee handbook, which applies to everybody, or you have recourse to your contract of employment, which is particular to you. Then, and the, and the implication is that organizations must sufficiently audit their employment processes, especially the contract of employment, employee handbooks, and expatriate policy, because it is whatever you have there, have in there that is provided by you that is going to govern the agreement between the parties, the relationship between the parties, since you cannot have recourse to the provisions of labor act for those people. And there are judicial authorities on this, where the courts, National Industrial Court, Court of Appeal have held that a senior manager, a director, a manager, a general manager cannot come to court and rely on the provisions of Labor Act. You also raised the issue in this question. You also mentioned redundancy. Am I right? Yes, but you had spoken quite extensively uh, on the issue of redundancy uh, earlier. So we'll just uh, keep that aspect of the question. So the other question that we have here is from Karen Khan. And uh, the question is how you think COVID 19 will change the current knowledge gap or technical expertise in the country. Uh, you, had, uh, you had specifically mentioned the oil and gas and manufacturing sector. And the question is beyond these two sectors, what other sectors do you imagine will be affected by the COVID-19? Is that for me as well? Is that question for me as well? Yeah. Hello, moderator. Can you hear me, sir? Is the question for me as well? Yes, it is, but it's oh, fine if you, you would like thank, to refresh the opportunity thank to take it. Yes. No, 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 no. Let me address it. I just wanted to be sure. You see, in Nigeria, the largest percentage of uh, expatriates are found in oil and gas. They are found in manufacturing. They are found in mining. But beyond that, we also have uh, international organizations. Nigeria is an equator or, uh, of, uh, of, of various uh, regional organizations that are organs of uh, EDA ECOWAS or African Union or even their research institutes. And all these uh, uh, international agencies have expatriates in their employment. Uh, for instance, Let's look at against, uh, institutes like IITA in Ibadan. IIT is an international uh, organization. There are a lot of uh, other uh, 
international NGOs operating in Abuja, for instance, and they have a number of expertise in their employment as country directors, country managers, or technical officers, et cetera, et cetera. So beyond the oil and gas and manufacturing, uh, the, this pandemic and the consequent restriction on expatriate movement will also be felt in the mining sector. It will also be felt among the international NGOs. It will also be felt among the uh, international agencies that have offices in Nigeria. Even what of embassies? Nigeria, Lagos and Abuja is the host to a lot of embassies and they are, and they are foreign nationals, the, the consuls, uh, I mean, work there. So if, if, if most of them have gone back to their country and they are unable to return due to the restriction occasioned by this pandemic, then these are uh, major concerns for us as a country and for the private sector. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Chinedu, I think, I believe the next question is, is to you. And the question is, what changes would you propose with respect to the issuance of immigration facilities, particularly with respect to easy accessibility? Can some of these be made available online? Please remember to unmute yourself, Chinedu. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Anne. And um, so uh, going straight to the point, for me, I, I, I would advise that um, this is the time for the Nigerian Immigration Service uh, uh, to uh, do a stop taking and a process evaluation and maybe re-evaluation. You know, it is uh, time to reject the immigration value chain uh, to ensure that it is compliant with uh, global immigration standards and practices. Uh, firstly, we, we expect a huge rush for, uh, from the expatriate community uh, uh, for the renewal of their permits and processing of their SEPACs and other immigration uh, permits, uh, particularly those who we are unable to do so before the lockdown, or uh, whose documents expired during the course of the, uh, the lockdown. So it is important for the NIS to assure Nigeria that they are ready to handle this unusual pressure, you know, and, uh, and traffic. And then, uh, further to that, so, uh, we also think it's the time for the NIS to start looking at the possibility of issuing uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, permits online. Uh, like the way uh, uh, we do for visa and arrival, we are expatriates um, are allowed to apply anywhere in the world and they come in, they give them uh, e-visa approvals uh, and they are allowed to come into Nigeria and issue the real visa. I think it's, it's about time the NIS should start looking at the possibility of issuing e sepac or e-permits as sustainable in other clients. So the current system of processing of SEPAC, even though it is uh, an improvement on what was obtained in the past, uh, it should be further improved on, such that expatriates and uh, immigration consultants should be able to apply uh, for SEPAC and other permits from the comfort of their homes and offices. And they should be able to also issue those permits uh, electronically uh, with perhaps a unique ID like the SEPAC uh, ID for ease of uh, verification and authentication. So I think uh, it is possible, although that will require a lot of resources and the rejigging of the entire immigration and architecture. But I think it's something that um, the NIS should start looking at to uh, streamline the immigration uh, um, uh, process and to also make it less cumbersome for expatriates to obtain their permits. Thank you very much, Chinedu. Um... Thank you. I hope that answers, I, well, I believe that uh, clearly answers the question. Um, Mr. Tilo, the next question goes to you. So uh, we have Chief Adewale Adeniji, who is asking, uh, and I believe you had spoken to this issue earlier, but it would be useful for his benefit to just quickly summarize your, uh, your comments on this question. Uh, so the question is, what will the doctrine of force majeure in contract avail any expatriate who has visa on em or employment issues as a result of the pandemic? Yes, uh, provided the contract of employment or the expatriate policy has a force major clause. Uh, I explained earlier that a force major is a contractual term. Two parties are inserted already into their contracts. 
meaning that you can only invoke a force major if there is express provision in the contract of employment. And two, if the event you seek to rely on is one of those events expressly provided or contemplated under the force major clause. Uh, equally say, for instance, uh, what we have currently is COVID-19, which is a pandemic. So we are the first major clauses uh, uh, or recite event like war, pandemics, epidemics, riot, insurrection. Then by mentioning the word pandemic or epidemic, COVID-19 is covered. But we are pandemic or epidemic is not mentioned. But the, copy, but the clause ends with an omnibus clause, such as where you say flood, war, insurrection, riot, hurricane, and other acts of God. The phrase acts of God refers to events beyond the contemplation or control of both parties. So COVID-19 will come in by the use of the word act of God. Or where you use the expression uh, 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 say, for instance, death, sorry, war, riot, hurricane, flood, and other causes beyond the control of the parties. That omnibus clause, another another event beyond the control of the parties, can also accommodate uh, 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 COVID nineteen. So basically, you can only have recourse to force major if there is a force major provision. But in the absence of a force major provision in the contract, you can invoke the common law doctrine of frustration, which, like I said, and I explained, is much more difficult to enforce because it must be shown that the event is such that rendered both the continuation of that contract to be totally impossible. And in this, and the example you have given, if by reason of COVID-19, uh, I'm, I'm supposed to resume uh, uh, two weeks ago from Canada and I couldn't come in because of uh, border closures, that COVID-19 will qualify as a frustrating element because it's totally beyond the control of the parties and there is no alternative means of performing that contract. Because if there is alternative means of performing the contract, if there's alternative ways of coming to Nigeria, for instance, instead of you flying by coming by air, if it can be shown that you can come by ship or you can come by road and it is safe and it is a, a common means of transportation or other means which you can get to Nigeria, the common law doctrine of frustration will not avail you. All right, thank you very much, sir. I believe that answers uh, Chief Adeniji's question. Uh, so we have a question here uh, from Nkechi Uzoka, which I believe is also uh, directed uh, to you. And her question is that, um, uh, for example, a company that provides manpower services uh, for the IOCs and because of COVID-19 uh, and the drop in the oil price, uh, the expatriates have become redundant that how, well, the question is, how will the employer pay salary to the employees? Well, uh, I'm sure what she has in mind is uh, the contingent staff, otherwise called the outsourced uh, workers. Uh, well, if your workforce uh, uh, is comprised of outsourced workers, that is a, what we call in labor and employment palace, what we call triangular employment, where you have signed an SLA with a service provider or a labor contractor to recruit those staff, which may include expatriate, and deploy them to, uh, to the end users, which are the IOCs. Uh, now, what are the options available to the parties? Let me quickly say this. If you are the service provider, and you are the one who has retained the expatriate and deploy him to the IOC or the multinational where he works. The first remedy available to you is what we have explained. Look at the contract of employment. Because remember, you are the one giving him contract of employment 
not the end user or the or your client that you have deployed him to. He is your staff. He is not the staff of the IOC or end user that you have deployed. So also look at the contract of employment you have issued him. If there is a first major clause, you can invoke it because the first major here, which you can plead is that by reason of this crisis, the IOCs has terminated our contract of our, has terminated our SLA, or they have invoked a post major by which we seen uh, their obligations to pay us uh, assist to uh, assist and assault. We cannot pay you. But I will have. I thought the question will come from the uh, from the end user perspective. If an IOC or a multinational or a company or any company for that matter has retained a labor contractor or a service provider to provide it with workforce. Naturally, a service level agreement will be executed between both parties, uh, defining the terms and conditions of engagement of that uh, uh, outsourcing engagement. Now, if the end user is unable to pay salaries because of the pandemic, and parties, and because the employees are even unable to come to work and deliver value. The end user, what he needs to do is to go back to the SLA. A good SLA, we have what is called a termination clause. We are both parties at liberty to terminate that contract of uh, that service level agreement by giving one month notice, for instance, or two months notice. So you simply serve the the notice of termination, that is option one. The option two, available to the end user, the client companies, is also to audit that same SLA, whether they have a force major. If there is a force major clause, then they can invoke it because what has happened to them, uh, if, if the event stated in that force major clause includes an event such as pandemic or uses an omnibus expression which can accommodate pandemic, then they can rely on it, invoke it, and terminate the service level agreement. In fact, that is not very difficult for the, for, for the client companies to do because what brought you together is an agreement, they will simply uh, uh, terminate it or invoke uh, the relevant force major if there is any here. And this again takes us back to the need to audit our employment processes and documentation. You cannot rely on first major if you don't have it there. And the doctrine of frustration is difficult to, uh, very, um, I mean, uh, much more difficult to enforce compared to first major. However, in all cases, the SLA is a contract, either parties are liberty to terminate. So, and when the IOCs now terminate or they invoke the first major, you that you are the labor contractor or the service provider, you are also left with no option than to also audit your own process and know what to do to discharge your labor. Because you are you don't have a need for those staff. You recruited them with a view to deploying them to your clients. And once your clients said they don't need them again, so naturally you also have to do the needful because you don't have salaries to pay. So he said that you, you also terminate the contract of employment, or if there's a force major in the contract, you also invoke it. So the same rule applies to both sides. All right, thank you very much sir, for that um, explanation. Uh, so to the very last question uh, that we're able to take during the session, we have a question from David Denny, and it is also uh, for your attention, Mr. Atilola. So he's asking, what your view is, or if you could throw, uh, throw some light on the decision of the National Industrial Court on the reduction in pay of workers, and whether there's a, there has been a decision of a higher court on the issue. Well, that, that's a very useful and a, uh, a very welcome question. To the best of my knowledge, there is no decision currently known to me on deciding on issues of unilateral reduction of contract of employment. But in labor and employment law, and this I'm very, very sure of, there is something called constructive dismissal. 
What is constructive dismissal? Constructive dismissal refers to a situation where the employer unilaterally changes materials provisions in a contract of employment unilaterally on its own, changes material provisions in a contract of employment, or where the employer treats the employee in a manner that the employee is left with no choice than to resign or consider himself sacked. So now, there, there have been decisions of NIC and Court of Appeal on what amounts to constructive dismissal. And I've defined you what amounts to constructive. Constructive visa is where there is a unilateral material change in terms and conditions of employment. As we know, salary is one of the most, in fact, indeed, is the most important provision in a contract of employment. So when you now unilaterally change it, that comes under the definition of constructive dismissal, which is actionable, which the courts, I mean, can, can, can hold the employer liable and award Damages. So we may not have decisions on the question of unilateral reduction of salaries, but we have decisions, of course, to the effect that unilateral material changes in terms of contract of employment, of which salary is one, amount to a breach of contract of employment, and also amount to constructive dismissal. Let me also say this. Uh, there is a doctrine called unfair labor practice. The third alteration to the 1999 constitution, uh, popularly, popularly called the third alteration to the constitution, uh, gives National Industrial Court enormous powers, including power to pronounce on what is what they consider to be unfair labor practice, including power to invoke international best practices in arriving at their decision. Now, what is unfair labor practice law? Unfair labor practice in law are practices that are considered not to be, not to represent best practices in labor and employment relations. I have no doubt that to unilaterally reduce an employee salary and ignore and, and without any engagement whatsoever, I have no doubt that it amounts to unfair labor practice, it amounts to a breach of contract, it amounts to constructive dismissal. Indeed, what the employer has done is to use the unequal bargaining powers between the employee uh, between the employer and employee to the disadvantage of the employee. Uh, labor courts across the world are public policy courts, and they are always very uh, they are always very ready to look into the the undercurrent and the nuances of labor and employment relationship. What is clear to us is that the bargaining power be between employers and employees are not equal. And the labor costs worldwide, what they do to do is to do justice by balancing this power. So I have no doubt that unilateral deduction in working hours, in salaries, without the consent of employees through engagement or through collective bargaining agreement is a breach of contract. It's an unfair labor practice and actionable constructive dismissal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, sir. And that's about how many questions we can take uh, at this webinar. Um, just to let the participants know uh, who probably joined midway that uh, the video or on the webinar will be posted on our uh, on, it's actually available on YouTube and will be posted on our social media platform so that you can catch up on some aspects of the webinar that you missed. Uh, I'd like to thank very deeply our two panelists uh, who have educated us uh, this evening quite elusively on the impact of COVID-19 on uh, immigration practices and the regulations in Nigeria currently uh, following the outbreak of the pandemic and also on how uh, employment contracts will be impacted or have been impacted by the outbreak of the pandemic. We hope that uh, we have been able to address, uh, address most, if not all of your concerns uh, today. Uh, 
before I quickly ask our panelists to give some final feedback, I'd like to, some final uh, comments before we close the webinar, I'd like to inform participants that we have the DCSL Academy coming up on the 4th to the 8th of, uh, of May. Uh, the details of the academy will are available on our website uh, www.dcsl.com.ng and also on all our, our social media handles uh, we also have the next the third edition of the webinar series coming up on the 8th of may uh, at 4 pm we'll be speaking that day on the topic business continuity and the role of the board uh, the details of this you will find on our social media platforms as well and I'll advise participants to please go to our website. Uh, it contains very rich information and uh, regarding governance matters and also on events that have happened post the uh, post COVID-19 uh, era. Uh, shortly after now, you will receive a link uh, requesting feedback on the webinar. We, we will appeal that you please take a few minutes. It takes approximately uh, six minutes to take those minutes to fill the webinar and give us feedback on how we can improve uh, on the webinars going forward. Uh, very quickly now, I'd like to thank our panelists again and, and to hear from them finally on any uh, final comments that they may have before we call the webinar to a close. Starting with Chinedu. Okay, thank you very much, uh, moderator. So um, certainly are, uh, these are difficult times and um, difficult uh, moments call for difficult and effective actions. Um, it is a given that the federal government would employ the uh, resources and opportunities open to it to address the challenges uh, that have been thrown up by the current pandemic and also take appropriate uh, policy actions to stem the further slide uh, into unemployment and poverty in the country. So some of these measures I mean, impacts on the employment of expatriates in Nigeria, as government's attention will likely shift to safeguarding the jobs of its citizens. So the extent to which companies that um, employ expatriates adjust their operations and processes uh, in anticipation to these uh, uh, policies will determine their continuing survival and the ability to retain their expatriates. So I urge uh, increased compliance by companies and it's most likely that strict penalties will be applied by the government, uh, partly in the bid to show up uh, dwindling federal revenue. Uh, companies should regularize their expatriate quota value chain and ensure it is in compliance with the uh, extant laws to avoid the dangers associated with quota trafficking. Also, uh, I advise uh, that companies should also be prepared to look inwards and identify and probably identify qualified Nigerians who will take up um, expatriate uh, positions, particularly considering the abundance of local resources and skills in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Inidu, for those final comments. Mr. Tilola, any final comments for us? Mr. Tilola? Oh, hello? I suspect we are having some technical glitch. Mr. Tilola, can you hear me? I'm here, I'm here. Any final comments from you before we close out the session? Well, uh, my final comment here is that these are uh, understandably difficult times and uh, strange time indeed. And of course, with attendance, uh, challenges and difficulties for employers of labor. But it is important that employers of labor corporate organizations act within the ambit of the law. Because otherwise, if in an attempt to manage your financial exposures and labor costs it is not done properly within the meaning of the law, the adverse consequences can even be much more greater than what you are trying to, to the course we are trying to avoid. The, the possibility of class actions by employees who have been treated unfairly, who have been wrongfully terminated without due process, without uh, uh, standard practices expected of the law, that's a major cost because 
And beyond that, and it, because if the court finds for them at the end of the day that they are wrongfully terminated, that comes with cost in terms of damages and all sorts. Then we should also consider the, the reputational risk that comes with such actions. Social media is currently flooded with all sorts of information, all sorts of unfailable practices going on across various industries. Uh, so employers need to think through properly any actions they intend to take. For instance, the the question from the last uh, the last question you asked. Uh, whether there is a decision on unilateral reduction of salaries. The reverse question can also be asked. If an employer feels that he has the right to unilaterally reduce salaries, that means employees to have the right to unilaterally increase salaries. So I can sit down from my home as an employee and I send you an email that our contract refers. Please note that with effect from uh, next week Monday, my salary will now be in, moved from 500,000 per month to 5 million per month. So if the employer's unilateral reduction is valid, so there's so that no reason why employees unilateral increase will also not be valid. So it cannot be a correct law that unilateral duration is, is valid. That is what is called sanctity of contract. Parties are bound by their contract. Even where there is a provision, that uh, uh, that parties can vary some clauses. It cannot be contemplated that the, the clause you will vary are fundamental clauses. You cannot. Salary is one of the most important clauses in the product of employment. You can change maybe work work hours due to exigencies of the time. If your resumption uh, time is uh, it used to be eight to five, you can say, look, because of exigencies, you will now move. So you now have to work 7.30 to 5 p.m. And we do it. Remember that over time, mostly and customarily applies to junior staff. Over time, don't apply to, uh, to senior management staff. Your contract of employment will probably say, as a manager, your working hours is 7 a.m. is 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. That same contract will further say that, however, depending on the exigencies of work, you may be required to do uh, extra work. And your employee handbook will now go for that under overtime to say for overtime, it's only applicable to junior workers. For overtime pay, it's only applicable to junior workers. And same cannot be claimed by senior workers. So if what if the terms you are very is things like resumption hours, working hours, the contract says Monday to Friday, but now you need they need to work on Saturday morning because of exigencies that can be taken to be incidental and minor variations. But to imagine under whatever guise that an employer can unilaterally vary or reduce employee salary without his consent, without proper procedure, without engagement, uh, uh, that cannot be a correct position of the law. So my final oh. word is that we have to act within the ambits of the law Seek legal advice before you take your actions, and it will be in the best interest of all concerned. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And on those, uh, those, we, we, on those final words, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your participation. Thank you for making the time to join us on this webinar. We look forward to welcoming webinar on Friday or you are the first to be. Um, we we'll thank you in advance for your taking the time to complete the survey. We remind you to please continue to stay safe and to adhere to all the safety precautions that have been advised to help us curb the spread of the virus. And as uh, we continue to pray that the virus will come to an end soon. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a wonderful evening and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye. you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.